have a very interesting episode for you today because I'm giving you a little sneak peek into some of the questions that I have for pet food companies and what I am looking for in a pet food. I'm particularly interested in today's guest, which is Oma's Pride, because they offer something that not many places offer. There are a handful, not very many. And because I work so much <laughs> with clients whose dogs have numerous food sensitivities, it can be really difficult to find complete and balanced foods that meet their needs when it comes to the sensitivities they have. So today's guest has not only a line of complete and balance, which we're going to talk about in, in regards to the questions that I have when it comes to complete and balanced foods, but also grinds that are single animal. So you're getting the meat, the organs, and the bone. That's it. Not a complete and balanced food, which is something that we have not talked about previously on this podcast, but is very important when dealing with dogs who have lots of food sensitivities. Now, of course, I always recommend working with a veterinary nutritionist or a canine nutritionist or a, a holistic pet health coach, somebody in the realm of that area when dealing with a dog who does have a lot of food sensitivities because we really need to dial in uh, that rotation and elimination diet, work on the gut, reintroduce foods slowly over time, but that's another story. So Oma's Pride is different. The, today's episode with Oma's Pride is different in that regard. Pay particular attention to the questions that I ask later on about the complete and balanced foods to get an idea of some of the things that I would ask if I were you. And of course, you are your pet's best advocate, so you decide what is best for your pet. With that, I'm going to go ahead and let today's guest explain the story, which is actually a pretty cool story behind how Oma's Pride got started and what they're doing now and the trajectory of the company moving forward. Please welcome with me, Adam from Oma's Pride. <laughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining me today and coming to talk to all of the wonderful pet parents listening. Uh, can you can we just start out by giving me a brief overview of Oma's Pride, the history? Because I know there's a lot of history and I know there's a story there. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to tell it. Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, we're delighted to be here. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and appreciate having a chance to share a little bit about who we are. Uh, so I'm Adam. Uh, I'm a fourth generation member of Almost Pride. Um, so I will take you way back. And uh, we always say that uh, the, the story has, there's, there's common threads, but every family member has a, a little bit of a different shade in the, on the family story, uh, which makes it kind of fun. We say it depends on you know, how many cocktails they've had uh, but, and around the kitchen table. But, um, but I'll tell my version of it. Uh, and uh, and we tell you a little bit about how we kind of got here. Um, so I, uh, my great grandparents, uh, Earl and Margaret, uh, they came to the what, what became the family property uh, in uh, 1950, uh, and they came with their two young daughters, and that was my uh, grandmother Sandy, who actually ended up creating our food, uh, and my aunt Cal, who lives still lives right on the family property in the White House in the corner. Uh, so they came and, and were from uh, Avon, Connecticut, which is in Connecticut's Farmington Valley. Um, and they were, they were humble, hardworking folks, not terribly well educated, uh, but worked really hard. So my great grandfather, uh, after World War II, they were affectionately known as Oma and Pa. Uh, Oma is grandmother in German, um, and, and Pa became Pa. Uh, but he, uh, he drove uh, a school bus and a beer truck. 
and uh, and my great grandmother Oma. Um, she was a very industrious woman, um, raising these two young daughters, and they had some some chickens on the property, and so they decided to gather up the eggs and started selling eggs door to door. Uh, and they had giant a giant garden, and really, you know, kind of lived a, a pretty simple life. But but we're always looking for the next way to kind of get ahead. Uh, it wasn't a giant working farm; it was a sm- very small operation. Um, so they started selling eggs door to door and did that for a number of years. And then uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, uh, had a, someone in town that had some turkey feed on the cheap, and so he purchased it and got himself some turkeys. And um, fast forward uh, about 15, 20 years, and he had uh, again. This is where everybody's got a different shade of the story. Between fifteen and twenty five thousand turkeys all over the property. Uh, so he was raising turkeys. Yeah, it was an interesting time uh, raising turkeys on the family property. Um, and they were uh, slaughtering them and processing them and selling them to area schools and supermarkets and feeding the community. And uh, they started a transportation business uh, um, and they, they had some local school buses and bus kids around. Uh, and this is in a, a pretty rural area. Uh, but they had built the business. They eventually, uh, in the 70s, um, USDA uh, kind of came through and they had a choice. They could uh, continue with uh, raising and slaughtering the turkeys or they could further process them. Uh, so they, they went the direction of they didn't raise the birds anymore. Uh, and we became a USDA facility. And we have been and we continue to be. It's the same building we still make our pet food in. Uh, and so we started processing custom cuts of turkey, uh, of chicken, beef, pork, making burgers, all kinds of stuff. And they were a food distributor up and down the East Coast, uh, primarily with poultry, but also with beef, milk, eggs, that kind of a thing. Um, and they continued that uh, for a couple of decades. Both uh, great-grandparents, uh, Oman Pa, actually passed pretty suddenly. Um, and uh, and my, my grandmother, Sandy, uh, and my great-aunt Cal, uh, they uh, inherited this business um, at, a, at a relatively young age. And so they ran the business as a food distributor and did that uh, really until uh, probably the mid-90s. Business consolidated a little bit. Uh, and that's really where pet food started to sort of come on. It was a very natural, organic way. Uh, so this isn't a story kind of cooked up in a boardroom. This is how it really happened. Uh, my uh, grandmother, Sandy, she uh, was this wild lady. She, I mean, I remember as a kid, her pulling up to my school in a Harley. Uh, with this like crazy blonde hair. Oh yeah. Uh, and she, uh, she had a sick dog appropriately named Harley. Uh, her, uh, her and her husband were living up in the woods in Massachusetts and raising dogs and llamas and running this business. Uh, and she had a sick dog and, uh, and, and, um, was feeding the best sort of, um, kibble and wet food, uh, and trying to feed the dog as, as best she could. This was like their whole life. Right. And so, um, the dog Harley started to get hot spots. And very, very bad joint issues. They thought they were going to have to put him down. So she talked to some friends that were very into, she was doing acupuncture, all kinds of stuff. Talked to some friends that were sort of at the start of sort of a raw organic movement, um, especially with people food. And, uh, and she, the family uh, pets on the property, always had meat scraps all around because that's what we did and live very long lives. So she, uh, she said, I'm going to give this raw diet that her vet said was likely going to kill the animal. Uh, I'm going to give it a try and we'll try it for 30 days. And if there's improvement, great, we'll keep going. And if not, we may have to put him down. It was a, a pretty dire situation. Uh, mm-hmm. And after 30 days, Harley was doing fly ball classes. So his health had improved rapidly. Yeah, it was, it was pretty remarkable. Health improved rapidly. Um, he was doing much better. Uh, and she said there may be something here. Um, and so we also sort of around the same time, because we sold uh, animal parts and ground meat and uh, bones and folks would come into our market and ask for things like soup bones or what we thought were soup bones, marrow bones primarily and, and chicken frames and things like that. Um, folks were starting to in the area kind of get into this. And so my grandmother took, uh, made some custom grinds of, of pet food for her dogs and uh, worked with uh, vets and folks that were at the beginning of the movement and sort of uh, naturally created some mixes, some things that we still have in place um, and, uh, and started selling them. So we sold them out of our small storefront. She took her little card table in the back of her truck, and she went up and down the East Coast sort of peddling her raw food, and they'd, they'd throw her out of pet shows. And she'd, you know, uh, she'd used probably some colorful language at the time and set up her card show, her little card table uh, in the parking lot and try to get people to come over. And she was, she was, uh, she was a force. She was really something. So um, she, they, my, my family built the business like that through the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, as a meat, bones, organs, vegetable focused, raw, natural diet, right? So the philosophy was supplementary proteins, rotate them, 
and feet, raw, meaty bones. So things like marrow bones, necks, backs, hearts, things like that. Um, and they built it through a network of staying mostly away from retail, but uh, built a network of breeders, bulk briars, uh, folks doing driveway drops, um, and, and some local stores and natural food stores. And it stayed that way for a very long time. Um, and so really at the beginning, again, of the raw food movement, uh, she, they, they started this thing and continued it. And, and I've only been back about four years. Uh, I spent a, a quite a bit of time in corporate America and then have come back into the family business. And, and we've worked really hard to not just service our existing legacy customers, but also bring forward a presence on, on uh, almostpride.com. And then also finding the real right partners in the independent pet channel, something we're really excited about. So I was looking at the the website because so y'all are pretty early adopters into mm. getting raw food on the market for yes. pets. And so I'm seeing there's a, a lot going on here. Um, and I, I love that it is a family farm. Is I Everything is still family owned, family run. That's what I'm understanding, correct? Yes. Yeah, we're completely family owned. Yeah. Perfect. So um, just as a consumer looking at the mm -hmm. website, I'm seeing raw whole proteins. So you can actually just get grinds of... Oh, yeah. I, I think okay. what, what makes us different, right? The way that our, our philosophy was built was really sort of, uh, and I don't want to call it old school, but it sort of is and was, uh, but the idea that, that proteins should be rotated. So our, our mixes don't have any, uh, any rice, any corn, any fillers, any binders, which is why a lot of them are in larger block formats, not uh, smaller nuggets. We don't put any tapioca or anything like that in there to sort of keep things formed. We have whole bricks and blocks. We've moved them smaller and smaller, uh, but it is primarily focused on its animal protein, right? All of this is we do it all in a USDA facility. We have an inspector there all the time. Right next to our pet food, we do custom cuts of poultry uh, for food service. So it is a USDA facility um, that we own right on the family property. So we're using all human grade stuff. I've eaten all of our ingredients. You can eat our food if it didn't have bone in it, right? Uh, so it's meat, bones, organs, and vegetables. And that's it. We have a line of complete diets, which are just our classic recipes with a vitamin supplement in there to make them AFCO compliant. So if folks want to feed uh, uh, a complete diet, they absolutely can do so, which has become more popular uh, in, the, in the past, call it 10 years, probably. Uh, but really, the, the, the core of our business and raw feeders are feeding and are, are, they're cycling through our chicken and veggie, beef and veggie, turkey and veggie, or some lamb and veggie, some combination of those. They're trying supplementary proteins, like we have a, a, a duck and bone. Uh, we offer, we do fresh ground green tripe. Uh, we have uh, all different stuff. We have a beef organ, which is very popular, heart, kidney, and liver, turkey organ, all sorts of organ-based mixes. We have things like, like uh, kangaroo, right? We have wild boar. So people are mixing uh, uh, we call novel proteins or exotic proteins. Uh, they're using necks, uh, raw meaty bones, a whole variety of a diet. Um, but as the consumer has, has evolved and gone from, a, I want to, you know, no offense to the cop. I love Costco myself, but a Costco bag of kibble to a maybe a, a cooked diet, right? I think folks are calling it, uh, we hear gently cooked a lot. It's cooked food, right? So use a, a cooked diet, and then they make their way over to a company that's more like us, which is truly a raw diet, right? And then they may continue on the spectrum and go uh, even more, right? Folks that want to eventually get to like a whole prey or something like that. But we sort of fit in that, that space of we have all kinds of protein variability. Great for sick dogs, great for dogs that have allergies, uh, or just interested and creative uh, pet parents that want to add some variety to their pet's diet. That's really kind of the space that we fit in. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's, there's a lot of room for a lot of these different things that you're talking about, especially when it mm -hmm. comes to getting like single proteins. That, especially now, because so many animals, so many dogs specifically are developing a lot of sensitivities um, for various reasons <laughs> that we don't need to go into in this podcast, you know, finding, finding suppliers where we can just get a single protein and the whole, like the, getting everything right. Like that is mm -hmm. part that's, that's something that is very needed. So if I can ask um, the complete recipes, 
Uh, yes. You did mention that there were some synthetic vitamins and minerals being added. Is that tailored for every recipe or are you using like a premix? How does that work? Yeah, so they're they are they are built. It's a a, a, a family uh, vitamin family owned vitamin company in the United States, uh, and okay. they source all ingredients are either North North America or South America. We don't have uh, Chinese sourced vitamin supplements, which I know have been an issue. Um, we are working to get more towards a whole food. I would love to say that that our our diet, even our complete, is just made up of whole foods. Um, it's difficult for a number of reasons, uh, but it's something we're working closer towards. We've only really, we had a, a, a chicken wolf complete. We call it wolf for, for dogs and purr for cats. Uh, it's pretty easy to keep, keep straight. Uh, but that, uh, we've, we've, um, historically we only had a chicken, right? We had a chicken wolf because folks were asking for it. Again, that wasn't the way our diet was built, right? It's really built supplementary. You can use our supplements, someone else's almost never. Uh, had this like burning desire or need to uh, be all of a dog's bowl or all of a cat's bowl. We think we have a great place in there, uh, but we don't need to hog it all. People can use other brands and supplements. There's great ways to complement that. And we encourage it. Um, but uh, the market, especially the retail marketers who've gone uh, to national distribution, partner with pet food experts, where independent pets really where we focus. Um, the Getting a, a beef complete, a turkey complete, a lamb complete, it's something folks just asked for. So to get back to your question, yes, those are specific uh, uh, vitamin and mineral packs for each of those recipes to make them AFCO compliant. Um, but they are still, they're not whole foods, right? Some of them are. Yeah. There's great quality ingredients in there. Uh, like yeah. there's, there's good algae and there's all sorts of different stuff that, and we, we make it as clean and pure as possible. Um, but the reality is we, we'd really like to continue to work hard to get more towards a, a fully um, whole food based diet because we think that's just overwhelmingly the best thing. Just real tough. Some of those AFCO compliant uh, measures are really tough to get on a consistent basis with things like, uh, you know, whatever your, at your specific add-ins are. Yeah, no, yeah, I get it. Um, and there are, you know, very handful out there, but it, you know, we definitely welcome more. <laughs> <laughs> to, but I, I we're appreciate working on it. I, I promise you we're working on it. Yeah, I, I do appreciate um, all of what you said. One, that, you know, you are still heavily focused on the foods being the primary source and the, mm. that um, the vitamins and minerals you're adding are very specific based on what that whatever that recipe needs. Um, yep. I think that's important. And just the the variety that you have where if you don't mind me asking the um exotic proteins how do you, do you also raise those <laughs> well so we so what we don't do anymore which which uh I would love to get back to it's just hard to do at scale and where we physically are uh isn't like necessarily like appropriate for it certainly at what we do so we don't raise any of the stuff on the property anymore but we do work with uh, our our suppliers uh are um they are, most of them are quite local. All of them are domestic. So we don't all protein and we say, we know there's a lot going on in, uh, in a lot of conversation about beef is a great example, right? If, if, uh, if they take, uh, you know, if they take a cow or they take, they take beef and they further grind it or even package it, right? In some instances, it can be labeled as, as a USA product. We know the specific ranchers that we work with, that all of our beef, all of our lamb, which is highly unusual, makes ours more expensive. All of our poultry is domestic. It is great. It is. It opens its eyes here in America, uh, and then eventually it's packaged here in America. Um, so uh, um, I don't. I don't know if I'm getting exactly to your question. Oh no, that's that. That's fine. Yeah. So so we're what... we, all of this stuff is here in domestic and uh, and oh the exotics. There we go. Yeah. So we have some some seasonal exotics uh, like our uh, um, we have venison. Uh, we have with kangaroo. Um, so a couple of those are imported and we're very clear about that. Um, but all of that stuff is farmed and raised. You can't sell wild game meat. You know, folks advertise the stuff's wild. None of it's actually wild game meat. You can't sell that uh, in the United States. Um, so all of that is we have a couple different partners that work with smaller ranches that, for example, may raise, uh, they raise uh, deer for venison and they're raised like free range and open in, in in penned areas and eventually they process them like cattle. Uh, but, um, we try to make the stuff as clean and natural. Um, I get, I get calls all the time. I still 
you know, again, we're a small family business. So uh, I get calls about uh, talking about a bill or something and I'll, I'll get, Oh, I used to drink beers with your grandfather. Um, so the, a lot of these relationships have been over generations and decades. And, and, uh, and, and so we're really, I think our sourcing is something we're, we're super proud of uh, and we feel really good about. That's awesome. So um, the, you're basically just a, you're just doing pet food now. If you're not raising the animals, is that? Yeah. So the, the lion's share of our business is pet food. Um, so it's north of 95%. We still do custom cuts of poultry. Uh, so we do, we serve a, a variety of other businesses uh, with cuts of turkey uh, that we work with farmers with, and then we further process them. So we may take a whole turkey and we may make it a, a boneless roast. So if you go to uh, like a wedding or something like that, and they have a whole, whole turkey roast that they're slicing um, or, or some sort of uh, event, those are, are things that we do. So we still do that for a number of schools and institutions. Uh, we are serving up until pretty recently. Uh, we're sending stuff on to submarines for the U.S. Navy. Um, so we still do uh, people food so that we're, we're still a USDA facility. Uh, but all of the uh, most of our business now uh, is in the pet space. We also, which I think is worth mentioning, uh, a lot of the pe people food now is really geared towards, uh, we call it, it's called Miller Farms. So it's Miller Foods, our business. Almost Pride is, is the people, and then Miller Farms is our pet food. Um, and what we did this past year is we started a, a, a 501c3, a nonprofit, to be able to raise funds. And we partnered with Connecticut Food Share, which is part of the, the Feeding America Network. Uh, and we uh, set a goal. And so we said for a small, a small 40 person family business, we want to donate enough turkey to Connecticut Food Share to feed 100,000 people. Um, so we would be, that would be the largest. Uh, 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 donating organization to Connecticut Food Share, which is a food insecurity is something, you know, is feeding people, feeding pets. That's super important to us. It's, it's in my blood, right? Uh, and so we took on the cause and uh, we knocked on doors and reached out to folks and, and we were able to uh, get it done this year. And we were able to donate 5,000 turkeys, uh, both with, uh, in, in partnership with a bunch of our vendors and folks we work with in the pet side. Uh, and then also with, with um, uh, grocery stores and folks that purchase our turkeys every year, because we've done that for, for years and years with a couple of partner farms and uh, able to feed 100,000 people this year. So something we're super, super proud of. People food's really a, a business of service at this point, And pet food is, is you know, how, how we sustain ourselves. That's awesome. Yeah. So people can purchase directly from your website and you ship. And then yes. you have, I think you mentioned at the beginning, you're working on some uh, getting into some of the local healthy pet stores. Yeah. Is so, that yeah. So the great way to get to find us, right. Is you can go to almost uh, and we ship to anywhere in the lower 48. I think we actually ship to Alaska also. Uh, and, uh, we'll ship directly to folks store. Uh, they have to purchase up to a certain amount and the shipping is free. Um, and that's a good chunk of our business. Uh, but we also have an established network of, uh, of co-ops of, of, um, uh, breeders of, of folks that buy in bulk. We still have folks where we drop off uh, pallets in, in a driveway and people that have been buying from us for three or four generations of dogs, 30 years, whatever it is, uh, long-term customers that we still deliver to locally. Uh, and then um, we partnered with uh, uh, a couple different distributors, but primarily pet food experts uh, across the country. We actually in January just launched, so we'll be available uh, in, in everywhere from California to to Denver and Washington and Chicago, uh, to independent pet stores across the country, something we are extremely proud of. All right. When I came back to the family business, uh, about four years ago, um, I, I knew that we had a fantastic product. Uh, we had uh, a great rabid group of customers. Um, and, uh, we had a really good story to tell, right. But our packaging wasn't, and our brand wasn't reflective of who we are. We didn't tell our story that well. And the number one thing I heard from folks is it's really hard to get your food, right? So those are all really good problems to have. It's really hard to have a great product. It's hard to treat people really well. And it's hard to, you can't create a story out of nowhere. You really shouldn't. People kind of see right through that. Um, and so uh, over the past several years, we've modernized our brand imaging, right? So people see our who we are. Uh, if you follow our, our socials, you, you get a good experience for what we are, what we're about and who we are and the family um, and, and, and our, our little business here uh, and uh, modernized our packaging and then made it really easy for pet stores around the country. Again, independent pet stores think that's super important. We think a brand like ours resonates there uh, and our online channel to be able to reach people affordably across the country. So 
Uh, we're getting closer to solving those problems and, and, and making sure that um, there's no compromise in quality in the product we make. And being a, a completely family-owned business, the way we are, um, allows us to do all of that very comfortably. So one, the first one, and this was actually um, when I was talking to um, a, a veterinarian friend of mine, she was like, ooh, ask this and see if, see if they'll tell you, um, is if, if there's a formulator you're working with, do you, or, because I didn't happen to notice on your website if you were advertising like a veterinary formulator or anything that you were working with to so, create the recipe. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I think, um, so we are, so I am not, right, I, I'm not a uh, 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 a licensed nutritionist, I'm not a vet, um, but we, uh, when our, our formulas were developed, most of them in the 90s, right? So at the time, we worked with folks that um, have, some of which have passed, right, are no longer uh, in the industry, um, mm -hmm. and, and my grandmother who developed them, she's also passed. Uh, so, um, when we develop these recipes, they worked with formulators and they, we have partners of ours that are vets that still buy from us, uh, that worked with us in the, in the origin of development of those. Now from there, we work with a vet nutritionist. We don't advertise it. Um, mm -hmm. but we work with in our, with the, the supplement company that we work with, um, uh, has folks on staff that this is what they do. So we're not working with a, like a, a nationally, you know, a lot of brands want to say I'm working with this right. person or this person. Um, so we don't have a, a celebrity endorsement. Um, uh, but we do work with folks that ensure that we are AFCO compliant, what we do. Um, but I think it is worth recognizing that out of our, um, she's called it 120 product portfolio, which is very different from most companies. Uh, we only have uh, five products that are, that we claim are complete diets, mm -hmm. right? So that is not, so our focus is giving people variety and choice and less, uh, prescriptive. Uh, we don't say this is what you need to feed. We say, here are the options, right? And most of our folks are building their own bowls. They're having some fun with it. Um, I think, and this is not a terribly popular thing, um, but I think there's also a recognition that just like human food, that feeding your pet is not a finite science. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you're off on a, on a mineral or a carbohydrate level by a percentage, just, uh, just like you and I, uh, your diet or vitamin profile does not need to be perfect to live a very long, very healthy, very happy life. Um, and I think there's also a recognition that the needs of a pet, just like the needs of a person, are going to vary with the breed, with the body structure, with the activity level, uh, with the quality that they're getting, with tons of other mm -hmm. factors. So I think there's, uh, uh, at least in my brief time in this space, and I'm not a vet nutritionist, or, or I'm not a vet, or a, a canine, or, or feline nutritionist, uh, but I think uh, occasionally there is a, uh, an obsession with some of the formulaic uh, efforts and there's an effort occasionally to discredit diets or companies or people. And I think um, folks that apply common sense, logic, uh, and then if they have real concerns, of course, we always say consult with your vet. Um, uh, but I think, uh, I think there's, there's an element of common sense um, and, and knowing your animal and doing your best to, to read and understand what's best for them that I, I think shouldn't be forgotten or lost. So I don't know if that gets to all the, the heart of your question, but um, yeah. I, I think it's important. That's a lot of what we are. Remember, our diet was built in rotational feeding, right? It's mm -hmm. about getting enough variety to fill the bowl, to get the full experience, uh, and to make sure that, again, they have what they need uh, as best you can to live a long, healthy, happy life. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. And I think, but I do think it is important to know um, because there is, there's a segment of the population that just can't, they just can't. And it's just like- 100%. Put, put something balanced in my bowl and yeah. I'm going to, you know, live the rest and of my life. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yes. A, yeah. A segment of the population that is very much into balance over time and rotating, like you're saying. So that's, that is definitely um, a model that is becoming more popular too, I think, which, hey, you know, it, every, like you said, every dog, every cat is an individual and feed them as such. So uh, yeah, it's just important to to get this kind of information out. So that person that is looking for put it balanced in the bowl, isn't accidentally buying <laughs> like a grind that isn't yeah. 
labeled as yeah. right. So just getting that information out there. Yeah, um, and that's super important. I, and I think that's where labeling, as much as those can frustrate, if you talk to the pet food brand, sometimes the the labeling requirements between states like aren't aren't consistent uh, or even in conflict. Um, and and but I think uh, in the way that uh, it has to be abundantly clear whether it is a complete diet or not uh, and who it's meant for. Um, I think that's a, that is a good protection for consumers that want a very basic for any number of reasons, whether they need to have it uh, or it just fits their life and lifestyle best. Uh, but I, I think letting them know that this is a complete diet and your animal should be getting everything they need from it. I, I think that's a great way to protect consumers. Yeah, there's no, yeah. I've got no opposition to that for sure. Absolutely. So my one other question, and I know you're pushed on time. Um, for those of us who are canine nutritionists, <laughs> who maybe would like to use um, some of the grinds or even the organs, um, creating diets for clients, do you offer, like if I were to contact you and say, hey, can you give me the breakdown of the nutrient on this? Do you, you have that mm -hmm. available? So it depends on the item, right? So some of these, again, small family business, right? Uh, folks probably don't know, but it's a couple thousand dollars to get full panels mm -hmm. uh, of nutritional yeah. values. Uh, it, and it can be, and sometimes, like here's an example, uh, uh, one of our long-term time customers um, has a an animal that has a, a particular issue or sensitivity. Um, I don't know exactly what it is, uh, but they'd ask for a bunch of information. We provide everything that we have. They're looking for some additional information, and our lab just doesn't provide that. I think there's probably additional testing. Um, there is no, there isn't like, hey, this is a complete panel and complete is complete, because depending on who it is, it's sort of, it is an infinite, uh, it's an infinite library of information. And there's also like wet matter versus dry matter versus uh, there, it, there's hard to compare different foods of different types, dehydrated versus cooked versus. So uh, short answer is for, for most items, we have what folks are looking for. Another good example, uh, uh, or short answers, uh, we have most of that. Um, but if it's someone that, that one of the benefits of being a small business, we say, hey, this is who we're going to work with and you've worked with us before, or you've been buying our products, and it's a real relationship. Um, I, I actually have a product going out today that someone wants and is asking for an updated test on, I think it's iodine uh, in a cat food. Um, and so I think that's the example. I don't I hope I don't mix that one up. But uh, we're going to send out to the lab because they are uh, a customer who's been with us for years, and they have a very specific question. Uh, and so I'm going to send the product out, and I'm going to do some testing, uh, and we're going we're gonna to take a look look at it and make sure that we're providing, Hey, here's what we had. Here's what we have now. You know, that's been X number of years. Um, so, uh, for, for like anything for the right person situation, whatever, if we don't have it, we can get it. Okay. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. I know you have to run and get your son. <laughs> um, just one last time, where can people find you on socials, website, all of that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you can find us um, at Almost Pride uh, everywhere. Uh, please check out almostpride.com. So our socials, uh, I think our team on on Instagram and uh, and Facebook. So across the meta platform does a wonderful job. Uh, you can find us on TikTok, uh, Almost Pride Pet Food. Um, uh, but check us out, like I said, almostpride.com. We encourage folks to check out our store locator on our website. We want to support uh, independent retailers uh, and our co-ops and folks that are out there and have been sort of spreading the good word. We think that they're vital to, to uh, that channel in particular, are vital to teaching people uh, and having resources accessible uh, and having good, honest conversations about the best way to, uh, to feed your pet. So um, we got all kinds of blog content, too, on our website, uh, and, and folks come in and do guest blogs to all sorts of nutritional topics. We'd love to have you on there uh, if you'd like to. Uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. But that, that's where we are, um, and, and we really appreciate anyone checking us out. Yeah, absolutely. And I will make sure to have all of that linked in the show notes as well. Thank you again wonderful. for your time, Adam, and appreciate the story. It sure is a wonderful one. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month 
for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.